Richard Rando is a popular KVOR talk show host here in Colorado Springs. He's heard every weekday in Southern Colorado beginning at 8.30 in the morning with such hot topics and local issues that truly matter. He began his broadcasting career in Illinois where he worked as a trial lawyer. After coming to Colorado Springs, Richard spent time as a reporter for KKTV before working in news and beginning his talk radio career at KVOR. He has also produced several television documentaries, including several for PBS. While at KVOR, Richard has hosted numerous community gatherings and informational sessions and has been the host of Palooza in 2009 and 2010. Would you join me in welcoming Richard Randall? Thank you, guys. I'm, I'm standing here, and I made a comment to people when I first came in. I said, so this is what I guess government looks like. Everybody hates government. They don't trust government. And you guys don't look that sketchy. I mean, uh, you actually look pretty normal. You look like you're hardworking people who show up for work in the morning, try to give me, my taxpayers, money, and get your jobs done. And I look around the room, and I do see people that I know. But I do want to talk about government trust, because... Uh, doing the research for today, whether it's Pew or Gallup or any of the other folks, the records are at all-time lows. And I think there are a lot of explanations for that. Um, part of it is, um, part of it is the culture, and part of it is the culture of the media. So let me back up for just a second and tell you a little bit about myself, because I think it's pertinent to know where I'm coming from and why I give you guys the benefit of the doubt. I'm not one of the 13% who says they can trust government. I'm somebody who believes that I can trust government. More often than not, I can trust each one of you, each one of your departments, each one of your people, and yes, there will be a bad apple maybe in the room, but there'll certainly be bad apples that are working for you or that you come into contact with. If you have that many people, there's bound to be somebody who's a slacker, who doesn't work that hard, who's got a racist email over here, or is cutting edges over here, or trying to scoot out early over there. That's just the nature of human nature. And, and what irritates me, you should know this, I've got a bias right off the bat. What irritates me the most about these not trusting government numbers is, is this. I'm willing to bet when you look in the mirror and you say, am I trustworthy? Am I, am I doing a good job? Am I trying to do a good job? Do I give the taxpayer and the people out there a good day's work? Most of you would say that. And then when you see something in the newspaper, or you see it on television, and you know, look at the headlines, and you go, wow, I'm going to be saddled with whoever that person was, and now people are going to think less of me because of that. It drives me crazy. I think we all know about Ferguson. I don't want to get into a whole political thing about Ferguson, but it is the epitome of lack of trust in government. And there are a million things that I could go into about it. There's racial components, cultural components, this and that. You know what? I trust cops. You know why I trust cops? Because I know cops. Because people like Jeannie Smith has had cop after cop after cop at trials that I've covered, and I think that they've done great jobs. And because every time I have ever been stopped by a cop, he's been fair with me. I was arrested one time when I was a teenager, my senior year in high school, and I was in public intoxication, and guess what senior in a town of 500 people was publicly intoxicated? And he did, a, he did just the fair and the decent and the honest thing. I got stopped one time for speeding, and I was speeding. I've never had a cop who was a jerk to me. I've never had a cop who, who you know, uh, stepped on my toes or hit me with a billy club or anything like that. Now, then again, I never said F you to a cop at 2 o'clock in the morning. I never said, what the hell are you stopping me for? No, I'm not getting out of the car. I want to see a lawyer. I've never done that. I did do stupid tricks by the side of the road one time. It was completely sober. Yeah, it was a little bit annoying. But the cop had a good reason to stop me because the bar I had just left to see a guy that I used to be in a band with was probably a pretty good chance people leaving that bar were going to have too much to drink, and he had a reason to stop me. And he was fine. And we went to court, and he didn't like going to court, but the judge understood the circumstances, and it all worked out. So I'm a little kid. 
There's a t-shirt now that you can buy that says, I'm just a kid from somewhere. Well, I'm a kid from Sydney, Nebraska. My dad worked on the Union Pacific Railroad. My mom was a, a waitress, and we had five kids. I uh, grew up alongside the railroad. There are 500 people in my community. My sister still lives there, 350 people now. Uh, it's ranching, and uh, she's got cattle, and she's got wheat, and I loved living there. I lived there until I was 10. Uh, it wasn't very culturally diverse when people say, Richard, did you come from a diverse background? Yeah, we had people who did wheat, and then we had some who did rye, and we had some who did barley. And when it came to cattle, there were a lot of Hereford people, and there were some Angus people as well. Uh, a lot of people drove Case, the majority drove John Deere. So we did have a certain amount of diversity in that community. And then I moved from there to Chicago, Illinois. So I go from 500 people to near Midway Airport in Chicago, Illinois. Talk about cultural shock. It was a pretty big deal. Go to a Catholic school for a couple of years there, move out to the suburbs, it's a grand American dream, you know? My dad's gonna buy the first house that he ever owned. We live in the suburbs, I go to high school, I go to college, I get my undergraduate degrees in journalism and radio and television. I didn't plan on that, I really didn't know what the heck I was gonna do in college, because that's the first person from my family who went to college. So I was going to be a psychologist. I thought it'd be fun to understand what you think and why you do things the way you do. And what you think and how that applies to what you do as a cop on a daily basis and how you manage your department and all that kind of thing. Well, about halfway through, somebody talked to me and said, well, you know what the BA or a BS, I mean, if, if you just get a degree in psychology, you're going to be changing bedpans in some psych ward for $16,000 a year. Wow, that didn't sound fascinating. So I didn't want to get a master's. I became fascinated with making documentaries and television and with cameras, and I switched degrees to radio and television and journalism. I'd written for my high school newspaper. I wrote for my college newspaper. I wrote for my law school newspaper. I wrote for a daily newspaper. And I'm here to tell you I was a pretty good reporter. And somewhere along the way, in those days, they used to teach you to be a fair reporter. They used to teach you fair and balanced. And one of the things that I learned along the way, whether it was television, whether it was radio, or whether it was print, was fair is not meaning that balanced is, you re oh, let's say abortion. You reach out here, you take the most pro-life person you can possibly find. You may take the most... Um, you wouldn't have pro-life, you'd go to the opposite end of, the, expe of, of uh, the spectrum and you'd have somebody who believes in women's rights and you ought to be able to just walk into a 7-Eleven and now you balance your story because you have the two extremes of the story. You don't have to balance the story at all. Most Americans don't believe that. They don't believe that. Most people are in the middle here. And more importantly, they're all trying to figure it out. And the key what we're talking about here today, whether it's the media, whether it's government, or anything else is, they just want the facts. They're pretty smart. I believe, I believe in humans. I believe, I believe that they are generally kind, that they need to be given the right information. And if you give them the right information, they'll come to the right conclusions. So I go to law school, and uh, I don't know, after the first year, I'm thinking to myself, man, this is decidedly not like Paper Chase. You're all too young to have known that. But it was a TV show that made it sound like it was really exciting to go to law school. And law school was fun. It was exciting. But it was a lot of work, and it was a little bit tedious. It was the first time that I had to work in life. Up until then, you know, I graduated C to average in high school. I didn't really sweat it because I had no goals. So I didn't know. Um, I didn't have parents who got on me about it. Halfway through college, I decided I wanted to go to law school. It's amazing when you have a goal, you actually start doing your homework, and you actually start spending time in libraries instead of hanging out with your fraternities, and all of a sudden you're on the dean's list, and you're on the board of directors for the college. Not the pretend little board of directors, but the real board of directors for the college, and you graduate with honors. After the first year of law school, I'm like, I'm not sure about this. My girlfriend wanted to be married to a lawyer, so I stayed in law school for a second year. And she was gone, but after two years, you end up saying, well, geez, what's the point of throwing this away? Might as well finish it. So you finish the third year. Well, what's the point of spending three years in law school and not taking the bar exam? So you take the bar exam. 
And unlike uh, certain mayors of Chicago, you pass it on the very first time. You don't have to go <laughs> over and over and over again. And then you say, as long as I pass the bar exam, I might as well practice law and see if I like it. Seven years later, you're sitting in court one day, and you're making a list, similar to the list that you made in college. And that list is of all of the things that you'd like to do in life. Now, pitching for the White Sox isn't one of them. Playing quarterback isn't one of them. Being the replacement guitar player in the Rolling Stones isn't one of them. It has to be a realistic list based on your realistic talent. I made that list when I was in college, and being a trial attorney was number three on that list. Now I'm sitting in court after seven years of being a trial attorney, and I got number one, I got number two. I got down to 31 things I'd like to do in life, and being a trial attorney no longer even made the top 31. Now, I wish I could tell you all to make that list, but I gotta warn you, it's a bad list to make. Because once you make that list, you got a real gut check. You've got to concede the fact that you're going to spend the rest of your life doing something that doesn't even make the top 31, or you got to do something about it. So I did something about it. I changed careers. I gave my law firm six months' notice. I said, I'm out of here. I started working on television, putting a resume tape together, and I went to work for a TV station in central Illinois. I anchored, reported there, came out here, and some of the folks in the room I met at KKTV when I was a reporter and anchor there. did television for about seven and a half years, and I've been doing talk radio since then. When I first started doing talk radio, I think the majority of Americans had already started, according to the polling data, to have big mistrust in government. I don't know if you went back to our founding fathers whether you'd even find out in those days that people had huge trust in government. We always want to be skeptical. We want to be cautious. Everything is a relationship. If I stand here when I met Mark and he came to my radio station, never know him. I sit there and I talk with him and we visit about this and 45 minutes later I think I know him pretty well and we have a relationship. It's not a big love relationship or everything, but I want you to think about everything that you do is a relationship between your employees and you, your boss and you, your coworkers and you, and certainly the public and you because the people like me say, you guys all work for me. All right? That doesn't mean I expect to tell you what to do, but it does mean I expect to get my value out of you. But more importantly, I want the truth out of you. I don't want BS. And I think the American public can handle the truth. So I'm going to ask you guys to do me a big favor. And I hate these people who come in, these you know, motivational speakers. And All right, everybody stand up. We're going to pretend that we're ducks for a second here. And everybody's like, oh, my God. <laughs> No, if ever anybody's inclined to do this, take just a slip of paper and write down one or two things on the piece of paper, and I'll have you pass it forward. It is either the most important news story in your mind, either today or in the past couple of days. And it does, this is not a test to find out whether you follow the news or not. It's just really, when I get home at the end of the day, this story burns me or it affects me, it affects my family. It can be internationally, it can be locally, it could be, you know, frivolous. It might be entertainment. Maybe it's, it, honestly, if some of you guys are saying, Richard, I know I'm not supposed to say this, but really, <laughs> the NCAA tournament is my big deal right now. It's a big deal to the president right now, so you can't be besmirched for that. Now, the second thing I'd like to ask you to throw on there would be conspiracies. When I was a little kid, I was uh, standing on the playground in fourth grade, and somebody ran out and told me the president had been killed. And I couldn't believe it. It was incomprehensible. Nowadays, kids would believe it. Nowadays, kids would believe that a huge building got blown up or somebody was burned alive in a cage or a bunch of people had their heads cut off. I've got a couple of teenagers, and God forbid, unfortunately, they believe that stuff because they know it to be true. But when I, it was just still kind of golden in those eras. And it was, oh my gosh, it's 150 years ago now that it was Abraham Lincoln. It was incomprehensible we were going to have a president assassinated. I'll tell you this. After all of this time, after probably 30 books, all of the documentaries, all of the guests, I've talked with people who are in Dealey Plaza. Remember the photograph of the guy with the white Stetson hat who's got Lee Harvey Oswald handcuffed to him and, and he's kind of cringing like this as Oswald gets, I interviewed him, I've interviewed all kinds of people. I still don't know what happened that day. 
I know that the National Choir, because I'm so darn interested in it, I bought it the other day standing in line, says that Oswald didn't do it, and it says who really did do it. But in fourth grade, I learned to not trust the government. Now, I didn't really, at that point, is when I found out there was an assassination. It was much later when I actually was old enough to look at the Warren Commission, and I started listening to people and reading other books about it, that I started saying what I still believe, and that is, I don't know what happened that day. I can't tell you. If your question is, Richard, tell me what happened in Dallas. I, I don't know. I can tell you this. Your government has not told you the 100% truth of what happened that day. They may have good reasons why they didn't want to tell you what happened. They may have good reasons why they don't think it'll be another 50 years before they tell you what happened. But it is things like that that made the public start saying, no, we can't trust the government. Yeah, pass those things forward, because I, I want to do something with them if you guys have a chance. Um, so whether it's conspiracies or whether it's the news and Hillary Clinton and her emails, I don't want to put, because my show is so political, I don't want to put any of you in a situation where I'm getting into the political aspects of everything. But we would all agree, I'm pretty sure, that if I were a public official, and you were paying me, and I had a really, really important job, that me doing everything on my private email, that I had a server in my house, and that people could hack into, and that when I wanted to, and Jeannie Smith or somebody from the police department or a, a DA or somebody said, Richard, you screwed up. You need to be accountable, and we want to see what the truth is. And I said, well, you know, I had some friends of mine go through the emails and decide which ones were private, which ones were personal, and then they deleted the ones that we really didn't. What? you got to be kidding me. That's not accountability. And if any of you, how many of you, I will ask you to put your hands in there. How many of you, if you thought there was a scandal in your department, and you had a DA, a prosecutor, a bunch of investigators who wanted to find out about your emails and what you had been doing or that sort of thing, and you said, well, I did this all at home, and I went through and deleted a bunch of stuff that I didn't really think was important. How many of you think you'd get away with that? None of you think you'd get away with it. And that is why the public distrust more than ever before. Now here's the second part of the component and the one that irritates me the most. Because this doesn't have to do with Hillary Clinton. It has to do with privacy, transparency, access, and one of the reasons, oh I brought this, show and tell. This here, anybody ever heard of the Academy Awards, Grammy Awards, all of those things? This is what you get if you're a journalist. This is the most, this is the biggest, most prestigious award you can earn as a journalist. It's even better than a Pulitzer Prize. It's an Edward R. Murrow. Won this a couple of years ago, and I'm incredibly proud of it. I'm incredibly proud of it. But I'm not proud of the profession I used to have. I still try to think like a journalist when I do my show. I said something the other day, a couple of days ago, about a political candidate. He's running for mayor. I gave my analysis of what he had latched onto in terms of his campaign. I said it was not a good issue, since most people didn't agree with him on that. But because everybody surrounded him, agreed with him, and told him that was so important and whatnot, he ran with it, and he's losing like crazy in the polls. Now, he didn't like that. So I got a text yesterday afternoon, somewhere on my phone here, and he said, well, I'd like to come on to clarify that. Now, I could be a jerk and say, there's no fairness doctrine. I mean, I've got to give equal time. If you, if you want to come on, all the other candidates want to come on, I've got to give you equal time. But I get to say and analyze and give my opinion on whatever the heck I want to, and I don't have to do that. There's no requirement. <coughs> but there is something, and I can see people nodding their heads. Fairness. If I mischaracterized what this guy was about, then I think I owe it to my listeners and the public for them to at least hear him and his version of what he thinks the truth is, and then people can decide that. And you know why I do that? Not to cover my butt legally. I know the legal ins and outs of what I can do and what I can't do on the radio, and I always stay on the right side of that. I never, and people are always, I ah, see you this, see you that. And you guys probably contend with that from employees and the public sometimes and everything. 
And the beauty of knowing when it is or isn't is the same thing that I had when I was a trial attorney. 50,000 attorneys in Chicago. 500, in Cook County, I should say. 500 trial attorneys. That means most attorneys, they sit in their offices, no offense to them, but they do real estate and they do this and they do that, and they're scared to death to show up in front of a court, in front of a judge, in a jury, and actually have to go to trial. Oh my God, that scares the heck out of me. But they're cocky enough to tell somebody like me, oh, I'll see you in court. And my response, and I didn't mean to be a jerk about it, but I'm not going to let people intimidate me, is, let's say you say that to me. Fine. You know what? I'll see you in court, because when you are in court, you're in my backyard. I'm in court every day. I feel comfortable in court. Do you feel comfortable in court? Do you want to be in my house? Because if you do, see you in court. And that's how I feel with people when they try to give you a, a false narrative of why you ought to be afraid. It's not about fear. Public responsibility isn't about fear. Transparency shouldn't be about fear that, oh my gosh, we're going to have Congress looking into what I do, and I could be held accountable for all of this. I will get a little bit political for you. So a couple of years ago, we have an attack on the United States on September 11th. It's not an attack on us, and a lot of people think it's not a big deal because it's not. It takes place in Libya, it takes place in Benghazi, and a bunch of Americans are killed. And I kind of feel like I do when it comes to the Warren Commission and JFK and a lot of other things. I don't know what happened that night. I don't know where on the anniversary of September 11th, all of our troops were positioned, who made the decision not to have our guys ready to hop in their planes on a moment's notice and go to wherever we needed to? And if over here is liable to be a hot spot, do we have somebody that can react to that pretty quickly? And again, I don't want to show of hands, but if that were you and it were September 11th that were coming up and you knew that that was a hot spot and something might go wrong, I would expect emergency planners and public officials to have a plan for that. Turns out everything goes to hell. We can blame it on this, blame it on that, whatever, but I will go back to another thing. The whole reason the emails are a big deal is because we don't know what's in the emails, Hillary Clinton's emails. We don't know, and there are only two reporters in the entire nation, really, who spent much time trying to find out what happened that night. Laura Logan's one of them, you'll probably remember her. She's a very attractive blonde, worked for 60 Minutes, you probably don't know her for her great reporting. You probably know because she was about killed in Tahir Square with all of the very peaceful demonstrators who just wanted an Arab Spring. They just wanted an Arab Spring, but lo and behold, this pretty blonde was in Tahir Square, and we're going to about to rape her to death. And so she reported about that. She did survive because her camera people and some other people got her out of there. But whenever she has said something concerning about terrorism, ah, she's an alarmist because she's got post-traumatic stress because of all of this other stuff. And then you go to uh, Cheryl Atkinson, who, imagine this, imagine you're sitting at home on your computer, you're working on something, your boss and a couple of other people you know may be concerned about what you're working on, and they don't have access to your email, so they probably do, but all of a sudden, the cursor on your computer just starts going crazy like this, and stuff gets deleted. Now, if they wanted to do that without you knowing that, they could have done that at 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the morning, but they wanted you to know that they could do that to you. Those are the only two people who looked into Benghazi. And this isn't a political deal. Benghazi is just a very convenient thing for me to use, transparency, public records, and trust in the public. There's a great author I just discovered in the past couple of days. He has four, oh, I mean, sorry, he has five moral evaluations uh, that each one of us used to de determine our politics, our religion, how we go about life. And there's some great questionnaires. Anybody who's interested in it, uh, talk to me after the program. I'll, I'll tell you about him or listen to my TV, uh, radio show even better. I'll, tell, I'll talk to you about that and that way I'll satisfy my station by promoting my uh, radio program here. But one of the things that you get into when you look at all of this has to do with trust and belief. And 
I've thought this for a long time, even about myself, but I'm sure it's probably true in one fashion or another about all of you. You get an issue, you get a problem, it comes across your desk, we need to deal with this and this and this. Ideally, you get all of the information, all the information, pro, con, everything in between. Get on the phone with all the experts you know, all of the experience you had. Hey, look, I've got an issue. I don't know how to deal with this. You look at all of this and you come to, go, come to a conclusion. That's the way it ought to work. But it's not the way it works at all. It's kind of like me and JFK. I think there was uh, something beyond Lee Harvey Oswald in that room. So that's my starting point. And now when I watch a movie or I read something, I look for things that buttress my belief and my opinion. And that's what we all human nature do all of the time. So when it comes to some of these controversial issues like Benghazi or the rest, you will have people who dismiss transparency out of hand because it's not convenient. They want to believe that nothing happened, the American troops were positioned, they were ready to go, nobody screwed up, it's just an unfortunate thing. So the videotape and some people ended up dying, let's move on. Why are you even looking into this? Here's where the transparency kicks in. If I wanted to know what the president or Hillary Clinton or anybody else was doing on that night, I'd first of all check with the KGB, they would know. I would check with the NSA, they would know. And I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding at all. Beyond that, if as an attorney, they gave me a release that gave me access to all of their electronic and personal records. And by that, I mean everything from a household appointment calendar to their cell phone records, to their Blackberry, to their emails, to the conversations with people that they had conversations with that night. I would be able to tell you, boom, Email here, 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 this is where he was, he got in the car here, he went there, he arrived here, he arrived there. What angers the American public, and it doesn't have to do with politics, it's divided. There are a whole bunch of people who say it doesn't matter, and a whole bunch of people who say it matters. I say what really matters is the truth. Tell the American public the truth, let them figure out what went on, and when any of you conduct your business in your department or your agency or whatever you're doing, and you're afraid, not just that your boss, but the public would know what you're doing, you're doing it wrong. Because if you're doing it right, you would be able to say, yeah, we had a fire, and look, a call came in at this time, I did this, we did this, we did this. Now, sometimes that stuff looks bad on paper. Sometimes uh, an absolute rank amateur can say, but look, there were seven minutes. But that's why as a trial attorney, I would bring in an expert from another city who works on a fire department and who would say, well, yeah, from the time it comes in until the time a human mind has time to process what's going on, get a little bit additional information, and look, he called this person at this point. He checked his meal, email at this point. He ascertained exactly the location, made a phone call, and people responded at this point. And the public would say, fine. You know what? They did their job. Where public officials run into problems are not that they screwed up. The American public, in my experience, whether it's personally and it's a personal indiscretion, or whether it's a professional mistake, the American public is pretty smart, pretty astute, and actually pretty forgiving. Why? Because they're not perfect. They've screwed up in their personal relationships. They've screwed up being a parent. They made a bad trade when it came to baseball. They made the wrong call in their kids' seventh grade championship game. They went on the wrong vacation. They spent too much money on this vehicle. We all screw up in little or big ways. And when the American public has the truth in front of them, and they know that somebody was doing their job, and doing the best they could under the circumstances, even if they were unqualified for the job, even if they made the wrong decisions, even if they listened to the wrong person, they'll usually cut them some slack. Where people get into problems is when you don't trust the American public. 
or you do have something to hide. And you're going to try to hide something. Because as a trial attorney, I have to tell you, let's say you're an attorney. we got a lawsuit going on. And I've got a piece of information that's going to kill me. It ruins my case. All you have to do is take a look at this, say, if we call this witness, Randall's case is gone. You win absolutely 100 times out of 100. Aha! You sent me all of this discovery. I get interrogatories, requests for documents. I go into court and I tell the judge, look, Your Honor, he's asking for way too much. This isn't reasonable. I get it cut in half, but you still want all of this stuff. So I tell my clerk, all right, fine. Put this document in with that box and that box and that box and that box of stuff and send it over to his office. And I will hope that he and his staff don't have time to go through all of that, or in their hurry to go through all of that, boom, it's already gone. There it is. <laughs> Going through all of those documents, they couldn't find it. So one of the things I want to, I'm not trying to tell you how to get away with stuff, incidentally. What I am trying to tell you is, when you hear somebody say, we turned over 50,000 documents, I don't care. I don't care if you turned over 30,000 documents or 50,000 documents. It's the one or two or five or ten you didn't turn over. That you deleted or had somebody delete or you pretended that it wasn't there. Think about this for a second. September 11th. Older generations, it would be Pearl Harbor. It would be JFK. Um, younger generations, it might be something else. But let's go with September 11th. I'm pretty sure every one of you can tell me where you were on September 11th. I'm pretty sure everyone can tell me who the first couple of people they talked with. I called home to find out if my kids were okay. I called the school to find out if they were letting people out of school. I called my brother-in-law in New York to find out if my uh, relatives went to work that day. Holy cow, do they even work in that building? You can probably tell me what you did that day. And I, and I can say that because I know human nature and I know my life. I can tell you exactly what I did that day. I can prove it. Didn't even think about it till just now. I got up in the morning. I went to the radio station. I had to do some reports. Don't remember what the reports were on, but I had to do two reports that day. By the time I got to KVOR, there had already been a plane that had crashed into a building. And being the smart aleck that I am and the know-it-all that I am, I told everybody there, you know, this kind of thing happened previously after World War II. We had a B-20 or a B-26, don't remember, but it was foggy, and that darn thing flew into the side of the Empire State Building. I'll bet that's what happened. Somebody screwed up and made a mistake. I'm standing there. Boom. Another plane hits another building. I was supposed to go to Nashville to get that award that day. Supposed to drive out to the airport, get done with the radio station, go home, meet my wife. Grandparents were going to take the kids, get on the plane, fly out. Everything is grounded. Nobody's flying anywhere. I can tell you that that day. I can tell you that I grabbed all my equipment. I called home. I checked with my wife. I checked with my in-laws. I checked with my kids. I got in the car, and the very first place I drove was I drove to Norad to find out if they were worried about a threat and if there was anybody there who could talk to me about grounding all of the planes. And when I was standing in the little uh, the guard check house there, I saw the building go down again and collapse. And I said to the guy, how many times are they going to show that? He goes, no, 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 that's a second building. And I couldn't believe that. I got in the car from there. I went to uh, Fort Carson to see if I could find anything that was going on security-wise there. I'm making phone calls back and forth with everybody in between. I go out to Pete Air Force Base to see if there's anything going on there. I check back at the station real quickly. And then you wanted some heartwarming stuff, good heartwarming stuff. I went to Penrose St. Francis, and already within a couple of hours at Penrose St. Francis, there were liberals and conservatives and young people and atheists and Christians and hundreds of people already lined up to donate blood. Because it rattled all of us, and we wanted to be able to do something. That's good news. My point, though, is if I had access, or you had access, to all of my phone records, you could find out exactly when I called. The guard post would say exactly when Richard Randall got there. So would Fort Carson, so would Pete Field. There would be people along the way who could say, oh yeah, I saw Richard Randall at the hospital. He's not making that sort of thing up. The point is this. There's no excuse 
to say we can't do it anymore. Transparency is something that's actually fairly easy. And it shouldn't have to be to lawyers trying to figure out how do we finally compel somebody to give us this information. And it shouldn't have to be to people on the left trying to find information out about people on the right and vice versa. There ought to be one group of people you can trust that's real transparent and you can't trust them. And that's the mainstream news media. And I'm embarrassed as can be to tell you that I have my undergraduate degrees in that and that day after day after day after day I see them falling down on their job. And usually it's not that they lie to you. It's usually how they spin a story or whether they even look into or cover a story. And in the old days, a lot of you probably know this, they used to have inverted pyramid. I learned this in high school. You write a story and you put the most important stuff first and then the bad stuff, I mean the less important stuff toward the bottom. And the reason you do that is you never know when you have some hack of an editor. When you're a reporter, you always hate the editors. You never know when you have some hack of an editor who's just going to say, boom, you lop it off and this stuff never makes the cut, but at least you've got all the really, really important stuff in. When I look at the news now, I can't tell you how many times I'm looking at a story, and I they talk about, they used to yell at us for burying the lead, the most important thing, the thing that you care about the most in a story, the thing that affects your family the most in a story, the most interesting thing in the story. You put that in the seventh paragraph? You gotta be kidding me. People aren't gonna read through all of that to get to that. Well, now the pertinent stuff, half the time, is there. And I don't think it's by happenstance. I don't think it's by happenstance. So I want to leave time for questions. But if all goes well, this will prove my point. Now, I could be wrong, and it turns out this doesn't prove my darn point at all. I'm going to come on here. Here's the theory. The theory is that of all of these things that are important to you, and first of all, I'm just curious about this, but out of all of the things that are important to you, or that you believe there may be a conspiracy, yeah, you took your chances, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> right. Durst arrested, and then Mesa, Arizona shootings, Hillary's email conspiracy, Ferguson overhaul city based on skewed statistics that supports racism. I'll give you a good example of transparency in the media. Eric Holder has a huge report. Thank God it wasn't Colorado Springs. Do you know how much trouble each and every one of you would be in if somebody came in, got all of your emails, more importantly, the emails of everybody who worked for you, and I gotta tell you, I get eight racist emails. I don't know why people send them to me, but there will be some racist photo with a little epitaph on it that goes to somebody, and they think it's hilarious to copy it to me, and I don't have time to send emails back and just say, you don't know me. This, this is not my values. You, I, you honestly do not get me when you send this sort of thing around. But out of all of the people that you represent, we can't kid ourselves and say, whether it's black, white, Hispanic, homophobic, whatever the deal is, that, that stuff is in the emails of everybody that is out there. It's only a question, is it two people in Colorado Springs out of all of your employees? Is it 10, is it 20? Is it worth firing somebody? Is that person in a position where it really matters? And, and that sort of thing. But Eric Holder comes in and um, I could go to Milwaukee and start talking about my favorite sheriff in the nation, but I won't do that. Um, Eric Holder comes in, he looks at all of this, and he says, well, if you look at the percentage of minorities in this community and all of the tickets, my gosh, you're looking at the average person in this community has got arrest warrants out for them, they've been arrested, and they've been all of these things. It's evidence of systematic persecution of all of these people. And I think to myself, well, geez. I mean, I know I'm white and entitled and everything like that, but I've never been persecuted. Maybe it would be that when I got the ticket, I deserve the ticket. And if I'd blown off the ticket, and actually, you know what just dawned on me? I had an arrest warrant out for me. I don't talk about this on the air, but this is a true story, CSPD. 
So I have a bad turn signal, and I didn't realize I had a bad turn signal. And I had a privacy thing worked out with the sheriff's department so that I didn't have to have my address and everything in the public record so nobody would come and shoot me and hurt my kids, and it was very private. But that meant they didn't send me a little thing reminding me every year that my license expired. So I forget that my license is expired. I'm going to work one day. Very nice CSPD officer pulls me over and he says, I would have let you go with a license plate, but I couldn't let you go with the expired license. Writes me up a ticket. I think I take care of it, right? I think I take care of it. But somewhere along the way, I screwed up something on the taking care of it. So I'm going to a basketball game at Fort Carson, and I'm going to go in. Oh, you got no license. What do you mean I got no license? Here's my license. It's never been revoked. It's never been suspended. There was a screw up. I go into federal court. They, they clarify the thing in just a heartbeat. But my point is, nobody was persecuting me. I screwed up. It's individual responsibility. So the media in all of that never ever considered the option that in any community, it doesn't matter whether it's Ferguson or Appleton, Wisconsin, then we just may have a bunch of black, white, Hispanic, Asian people who culturally just don't respect authority and don't care. All right, Ferguson. Emails are important, transparency is important, and I don't think that Eric Holder and the State Department did a good job in terms of transparency. Ferguson again here. Um, Helen Collins claims to be a victim of a witch hunt. I, I disagree with that. I look at that transaction, I'm like, man, I'd like to make a transaction like that. But all you have to do is throw up Douglas Bruce's name or say that you're a victim, and all of a sudden everybody's like, oh my gosh, a victim being persecuted. I will tell you, I don't know the ins and outs of this. I'm not going to sit here as a judge and tell you. But I will tell you that information and transparency in terms of when the transaction took place, who signed the document, all of those kinds of things will tell us the truth about whether there is something there or whether it's a witch hunt. And one of the things that drives me crazy is, poor, poor me, I'm a victim, and I'm a victim of a witch hunt. Um, has, is there anybody here who likes basketball? Guys? All right. Anybody uh, ever watch ESPN, ESPN on basketball? Do you know who Christian Leitner is? They did a thing on hating Leitner the other day. Now, it turns out I'm a Duke fan only because my kids, one of their coaches for two years for my daughter, two years for my son, is a Duke alumni and a Duke fan. So he ended up getting them to be Duke fans. My kids are Duke fans, so I'm a Duke fan. So I remember Christian Leitner vaguely, and I watched this thing. He's a basketball player, and he was pretty feisty and stuff. And, and so people hated him. And it's much like I was saying before. They make up their conclusion, and then they find everything they can to either hate or to love him. Well, we got in the news today, we've got Ashley Judd. People want to rape her. They want to torture her. They call her the C word, the B word, all kinds of words. And do you know what her big crime was? She said, go Big Blue. She, she's a Kentucky fan, and, and so I don't know who hates Kentucky when it comes to basketball so much, but people are vicious. Same thing with Kurt Schilling. Without well, transparency, and I look at stories like that, I would advocate every one of you, when you post something on Facebook about your daughter, your wife, your girlfriend, whatever it is, and somebody says, oh, we got to do this and this and this and this and this, I love transparency. I love tracking down the guy who said he wanted to rape Kurt Schilling's daughter because he said my daughter's going to get a scholarship to come play softball, and it turns out, yeah, that transparency. We found out that you work for the Yankees. We find out that you sell tickets for the Yankees. You just lost your job over those 140 characters, and guess what? If I work for a baseball team, or I work for the city, or I work somewhere else, and it turns out that I find out you're the guy who did that, even if I wanted to cut you some slack and say that you were young and stupid, because you didn't say, yeah, they're a pretty hot daughter. You said you wanted to do some of the most vile things in the world. He tracks it down, kid loses his job, other kid loses his job, at, uh, and he's suspended at a college, right, college radio station and all of that. And the message is the transparency of those 140 characters now means when he's sitting across from me from an interview, and I say, yeah, but what about this? See, because if I hire you and you harass this woman, 
then the human resource officer is going to say, but Richard, you knew this as a guy was a problem when you hired him. He did it in the past, now he did that to you. Everybody's liable. It's going to cost the taxpayer a whole bunch of money. <sighs> Point. Everything from just Facebook and loving a basketball team, transparency is going to happen more and more on that area. Where we need it to happen more and more is in the public sector, and I think you guys have got a lot less to hide than some of the high-profile names that I'm talking about and mentioning. And if it turns out that you haven't conducted your business in a way where it's like, oh, Richard, you know what? <sighs> Somewhere in those 5,000 emails, there's probably one that shouldn't be there. Deal with it, because you don't want to be in that person. Government corrupt, uh, cover-up of Libya attack. Hiding of emails by the State Department, lack of coverage of Fast and Furious. Every one of these wouldn't be an issue if long ago we had transparency, we had the information, or we had a news media that aggressively went after this. How am I doing on time? Oh, good, okay. Um, and if I don't get to yours, we'll get on that. Hating on the police by the general uh, public, the general federal government overall theme of this, especially since Ferguson, all police officers, police agencies are evil and corrupt. Uh, I want to tell this to everybody who's a cop and knows a cop. I know there are people who hate cops. My son just started driving. And we'll be driving, and there'll be a cop behind us, and he always says, Dad, do you ever get that little pit in your stomach when there's a cop behind you, even though you haven't done anything wrong? And I said, yeah, when I was first starting to drive, I had that little pit in my stomach. And I still get it now. I'm doing everything right. The car is registered now. I did pay that ticket, and everything is good. But I think in a healthy, good person, somewhere along the way, you've been taught to respect, not to fear, but to respect authority. And... It's not transparency that's the biggest problem when it comes to hating cops. It's that, assume this room is filled with cops. I could probably, if it were all cops in a major city, I could find somebody who was a bad cop. And would that be fair to all of the rest of the cops for the news media to hold up this one cop who did something wrong and say all of these people are like that, and yet the news media does that day after day after day. I would like the transparency of, give me some perspective. Show me how rare it truly is for that to happen. Or we've got a case in Virginia now. Oh my gosh, I don't know if you saw the photograph. There's a kid laying on the ground. He's got blood on his face. Well, it turns out the kid was trying to get into a St. Patrick's Day bar. And we had an alcohol enforcement person there who had a problem with how drunk the person was to begin with. I think that's good for society. We don't want people getting even more drunk. And the kid had an attitude problem with the cops. And I don't know where that comes from. I mean, I learned early on that you're kind of respectful of authority figures. I don't know what all of you guys do, but I guarantee you, you do stuff that's more important in the bigger scheme of things than me. And I probably ought to respect all of you for what you do, for how you serve the community, but certainly because of your position of authority. And when we have a culture that instead, and I'll just be blunt with you, you guys didn't come here to have somebody, you know, uh, pretend to be otherwise. You're marching, you're protecting a bunch of Ferguson protesters, and I'm standing alongside of you. F-bomb, F-bomb, F-bomb. You're a, you're a disgrace to your race. You ought to take that uniform off and join us. It is a miracle that we don't have more people get clocked in the head by cops who lose their temper. It is a truth. <laughs> I'm serious. Nobody ever thinks about that. The average American, would they have the patience and the training, whatever you guys do, to put up with that guff? No. And they sure as heck didn't have that 10, 20, 30 years ago. I remember a friend of mine in college. Steve Carter was his name, and he was drunk one night, he was driving home, got pulled over by a cop, 2 o'clock in the morning, and he was mouthing off to the cop, which in Chicago was a decidedly bad idea to do in those days. <laughs> and so they had, you know, batons. And in order 
to humble my friend and get him to pay attention a little bit and to quit swearing at him. The police officer did something that was probably illegal, but he took the butt of his baton and he went boom right into the solar plexus. I've been hit there a couple of times. Not by cops because it would be rude, but I've been hit there a couple of times. And man, it gets your attention. There's only one way you can get a guy's attention quicker than that. That's the second best way to do it. And I remember, and this is a good friend of mine. We were in a band, and he couldn't understand why I wasn't sympathetic to him. I mean, the cop hit me, and this and this, and I'm like, but Steve, what, what do you expect? when you're being rude and disrespectful to somebody. I mean, I'm not saying that he should have done that to you, but I would have done that to you if I were the cop. <laughs> and there are bad cops. I'm here to, I came from a family where there was never racism in my family. My dad worked on the railroad. He, his best friend was black. He, he had a lot of people who were Native American Indians and Hispanic working for him. I never heard a racial epitaph in my family at all. But for whatever reason, my dad's brother was a whole other story. He was a cop in Chicago. He got fired, we never knew why. It just happened to get fired off the police department in Chicago and boom, you're gone. Um, but he used to brag at Thanksgiving. Can you imagine this? It's Thanksgiving, right? And we got a guy who is bragging about loving to pull over black people. And so you're a black person, I pull you over. I don't have to really have a reason to pull you over. And I ask for your driver's license, you can go and hand it to me, and I say, well, wipe off the sickle cell before you hand that to me. And then when you get out of the car, I, I stand on your toes, hoping that you'll push me to get me off your toes, because if you do that, I'm going to club you in the head, and I'm going to arrest you for resisting arrest. There are bad people. But in the long run, innocent people, and good people, I still have faith, don't get nailed to the wall. There are exceptions. I used to be a trial attorney. I never lost a jury trial. Yep, O.J. Simpson. I was guilty. Simple as that. Guilty. There were cultural reasons why he walked. It wasn't, uh, you know, standard of proof or anything like that. Though I did watch Mark Furman on a program the other day, and he was such a knucklehead that if I would spent much time watching that trial, it probably would have been otherwise. But Ferguson, because a lot of this will deal with Ferguson, you have to remember this. We had an attorney general who, when he was a young man at Columbia, uh, you know, he took over an ROTC office, or a former ROTC office. Uh, they said that they had an arm takeover over it. He wanted it to be an all-black student union and named after Malcolm X, and uh, eventually they ended up doing that. Now, a lot of people, if you look for the racist, here's how you can tell a racist. They take somebody from the 1970s who's got a fro, he's got a big fro, and then they'll assume, well, look at this guy because of the fro. Well, guess what? People had long hair in the 1970s. Black guys had big fros in the 1970s, and I had hair shut down to here in the 1970s. All of my friends did too, and we were jocks. We weren't hippies, we weren't radicals, we weren't any of those things. But where you can find is that in California today, they've got somebody who's a cop killer, who they want to name a student union after and want to give her recognition. We got the Angela Davises who are in the college uh, community. Wouldn't you love to have the emails of some of these 1960s and 70s leftover radicals and find out what they're saying? I mean, everybody makes a big deal about what Sony was saying in some of their emails and stuff, but that's okay because politically they're on one side of the line. Uh, let's see, Tunis, uh, Tunisia conflict, many killed tourists, etc. in Tunisia. That's not big news. We've got over 20 people. It's now becoming such standard stuff that, you know, it's not big news, but it could be, it should be, and I guarantee you, if we had freedom of information and access, we would know whether there were prior threats. We would know whether there were prior alerts. We would know whether those terrorists had been on somebody's radar prior to that. I want you to think for a second. The mayor's book. Oh, that's a good question. I'm glad somebody asked that. Because here's my first, I had the mayor on my show the other day, and I, I thought I brought the book with. I brought so much stuff, I'm not sure. Does everybody know what the mayor's book is? Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. Well, it's a cute looking book. And I like, I personally, just so you know, I personally like the mayor, and I think he's trying to do a good job. He and I have talked, he's made it clear on my show that he is not the best person when it comes to personality and, and what's not. He's in the private sector, he's used to telling people what to do, and when they do what they tell him to do, so he's bumped heads a little bit. But my first question about the book was, I think, what a lot of people's first question about the book was. Not the contents of it, not what are the bad things, the good things, and all. How much did this cost? That's what I wanted to know. I, I, I assume that this is probably a little bit flattering about you and your administration and whatnot, but the main thing I wanted, it's $2,600 is what he said it cost. Now, I, I don't know whether that's the case or not, but see, the point would be, with transparency, we'd be able to know that exactly. We'd be able to know who put the book together, how much time it took to put the book together, were they employees, how much do they get paid per hour, how much were the printing costs, all of that. I think $2,600 was the printing cost. But I guess when it comes to trust of government and transparency, they are so linked together, and it is the lack of transparency, either compelled transparency or voluntary transparency, that has led to as much mistrust as we have had. And that can be on the left of people who don't trust that we went to Iraq for the right reason and that there were weapons of mass destruction. And it can be on the right, whether it's Ferguson or Tunisia or anything like that. I could go through all of these and, and I won't, I'm using them for my show though. I won't identify anybody, but I guarantee you almost all of these will fall into that category, whether it's conspiracy or news, because public trust Mistrust of government and transparency play into all of this. Pew and, and uh, Gallup say that about 13% of the public really trust government. <sighs> That's sad. I have more trust in government than 13%. I really do. Even on the federal level, state level, local level. I really believe that everybody in this room, not everybody, most people in this room, because I don't know y'all, I can't say everybody, that most people in this room really want to do a good job, really want this to be a better city, want it to be safe for, for my kids to drive through this part of town. If I need to go up to the store at 11 o'clock at night, want me to be safe to be able to do that. Don't want our kids to have to go to school and worry about getting beat. How many people saw this video from uh, Indianapolis the other day where the girl was ambushed and videotaped and they just beat the heck out of her? I mean. We want our communities to be safe. We want our kids to be safe. Fundamentally, I believe that all of us, male, female, black, white, whatever, whatever your religion is, whatever your background is, a lot of the common things in terms of what we want from the community, what we want from government, they're all the same. And as much as we want a safe community on our end of it, I really have faith that all of the guys wearing badges in here, women wearing badges in here, people who enforce laws and, and try to have safe streets and, and take care of potholes and all of those kinds of things, want to do the same thing. And I can do my part in trying to make sure that in the areas where there is legitimate distrust of government, <laughs> that I expose it. What I can't do is I can't make the media do their job. I just, I can't, I, I have no control over that. I can't do that. I can't do anything about the people who know the media won't do their job and get away with lying and covering up and destroying documents and doing all of that. And I have no control or little control over elections where people will say, well, that person looks kind of good and I heard good things about that person. And they don't go two or three levels down to, can I really trust this person? So I'll leave it at that. And I will leave room. Do I have room for questions and answers? Let's do that. If there are any questions uh, or things that I can comment on, uh, let's, anybody? All right, let's all go home. <laughs> it's too early to go home. There has to be a question or something that you disagree with or uh, something specifically here. Anybody? Got a question. Sure. Do you, do you ever think we're going to get back to, to real journalism? Um, I mean, are, are, we, are we too far? Is the ship too far down? Uh, you know. That is a, that is about as good of a question as there is. Are we ever going to get back? to real good journalism, whether it's television, or whether it's newspapers, or electronic, or talk radio. I gotta tell you, I'm worried that we won't. 
I, I, I look at the culture, and, and I always think about cultural limbo. You know, you can get online now. I mean, when I was a kid, if you wanted to look at a naked woman, uh, one of your friends would have a stolen copy of Playboy from his dad or his brother or something like that. Oh my gosh, look at that. Now, my kid is one click, of, and I've got all kinds of stuff on my computer, mind you, or whatever, uh, for him to be filtered and whatnot. But all he's got to do is Google this, click that, and that. And so I wonder, are we ever going to raise the bar culturally on any of this stuff, much less journalism? And my goal on talk radio, I can tell you right now, it's not, it's not very high. It's not to raise the bar. I can only raise the bar I try to in terms of what I say. I don't like saying crap or, or you know, bad things beyond that. I sometimes, if somebody calls um, somebody an Uncle Tom or a house nigger or something like that, and I'm talking about it, Sometimes I'll use blunt language because I want people to know exactly what has been said. I don't want there to be any doubt about it. And usually you can get around it without having to be offensive. But I don't like lowering the bar on my program or whenever I see <sighs> mainstream television. I can't tell you how many times I have to, you're probably like it, you have to dive for the remote control. And it's not always Cialis or, or something violent or the way you get girls with bikinis in the laundromat is to get them drunk and to buy alcohol and all this kind of thing. Sometimes it's as simple as, my gosh, really, here in the middle of the Rockies game, did you know that they have this thing about a serial killer where they're going to show that he murders and, and uh, tortures these people? I worry about the bar going lower and lower. I try to keep the bar right here, but with the current generation of journalists and young journalists, I don't see them aspiring to raise the bar, and I'm part of the problem. I remember when I first heard talk radio and it was first starting out, I was a television reporter at the time, and I thought, well, you know, this is just the way it was when my idols, Walter Cronkite and Eric Severide, a lot of these guys, at the end of their newscast, they would do a commentary. And sometimes they were right, and sometimes they were wrong. I mean, Cronkite went to Vietnam. He saw what was going on there. He hated seeing Americans get injured and hurt. And he was very emotional and didn't really understand all the facts. And they told America it wasn't worth it, but let's get the heck out of there. It's kind of like what's going on in Afghanistan and Iraq and a bunch of other places. And they don't worry about what happens when we leave it behind. But at least in those days, there was a clear defining line between the editorial pages and the news pages. Most newspapers, that's not, I, they still have it. They have the news section, they have the op-ed uh, section and stuff. But I don't need to tell you that if you look at the news stories, whether it's the placement of the information I was telling you about before, or not covering the story, or I can't tell you how many times I look at in the newspaper, and there's three paragraphs on page 17 of an article that ought to have been the lead story. And, and I will tell you, did, did, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you guys, you guys all come from somewhere did, did anybody see? I don't want to do this out. Did anybody see a newspaper after Eric Holder that said, "Hands up! Don't shoot! Total BS! Never happened! Was no component! Complete false narrative! Uh, NFL football players who came out with their hands up doing that! All of the protests! The wonderful CC students who shut down the downtown because oh, we're protesters and we're out there! You didn't know what you're talking about!" Um, the current crop of journalists, I don't think, aspire to what me and my friends aspired to, even when I was in high school. If I was doing a music review with Derek and the Dominoes, I wanted Layla, I wanted to do a fair music review, much less all of the important issues that are going on now. They think that they have to balance out talk radio. And this network thinks that they have to balance out that over here. And I was talking about a, a sheriff from uh, the Milwaukee area uh, after um, Ferguson. And I remember seeing uh, this is a big deal. And it would be, it should be a big news story if it was true. There were some congressional people walking into, uh, into Congress one day. And the allegations were that caucus were spit upon and were called the N word and a lot of other things. And so they have a panel discussion on CNN. And there's a Hispanic woman there who's saying, well, my boss got spit on, and, and or 
the person who ultimately I respond to, it's not she knew, personally knew him, she's like three or four levels below him, or it was at the time, uh, they got called names and everything, but there's a black reporter there who says that didn't happen. I was there doing a live shot. I mean, I do tons of live shots in my time. You stand there, you got TV camera here, you got your notes here, you got all of the lights here, people are walking around you. Trust me, you're cognizant of what's going on around you. You're focused and waiting for them to give you the red light and to cue you for your live shot. But you're not oblivious to what's going on. And this guy said, it simply didn't happen. I saw these people walk in. They were right next to me. I heard what was said. I saw what was said. I talked to people after the fact. Now, one of those people has ever said that they were called names or spat upon, and it didn't happen. And by God, he's sitting here, this woman is sitting over here, and she kept saying it happened, it happened, it happened. I'm like, when you have first-hand witnesses who are telling you it didn't happen, how can you buy into the narrative? I, I allowed for a lot of this being just rebellious. I was young, I was rebellious, you know, I didn't know what the heck I was rebelling against. Uh, I allow for that, but once you start working for a newspaper or a TV station or you're an analyst or you know something with credibility, Huffington Post or whatever, this isn't sitting in your parents' basement writing your own little blog and saying whatever the heck you want to. And if I do have a frustration, it is we don't have any checks and balances in terms of the real media. We have absolutely no checks and balances of people putting stuff up on YouTube or all over the place. I wish I could tell you, yep, it's right around the corner. It's going to come back. I'm real worried that it won't. I, it, what it's going to take is it, it's going to take people who are journalists. I, I have always wanted, maybe this will prompt me to do it, I've always wanted to go back to my journalism professor and say, what would you guys think about what's going on today? And, and they were all liberal, mind you. But I think the people who advised me on the papers I wrote for, and the TV shows I did, and taught me how to be a, journalism, a journalist, I think they'd be disgusted to see what's going on today. I don't know how they could be otherwise. Any other questions? There you go, Jeannie Smith. I just can't resist asking you a question for yeah. a change. There you go. Uh, some years ago, I was having a, a rather animated discussion with a print media representative about their balance of coverage. And he said to me, you have to understand, people expect government to do things right. It's only when you do it wrong that it's news. And I don't blame the media for that. I, I think that is, in a sense, what people will buy. I think that's true. The consumers are driving so uh, what I'm wondering from you is, can you see the public official who could do it in a way, and I, when I say it, I mean public relations, yeah. in a way that worked and was positive and garnered that positive breath? You know, that, that, uh, bringing me here today, that's probably the best question, really. And I suppose I should start a consulting business and make millions of dollars doing this kind of thing. Um, I think the fact of the matter is, as you well know from your positions, so many people who go out there, they're only out there because of the news of that day, that trial, that case, that whatever. They're not out there to say, so what is your conviction rate? How's that going? Are we getting bad people off the street? Or that kind of thing. Because, and I think they're wrong that public assumes that. The public hopes for that. They want that. They long for that. And like I said, I want it to be a safe community and whatnot. But it is the nature of news to go out when something goes wrong. I remember a consultant, a friend of mine, she, she was an anchor, and her advice was, well, Jeannie, here's what you need to do. You, you need to, instead of having a press conference, don't have it in your office with a bunch of law books behind you. You need to go outdoors somewhere and put Pike's Peak behind you, and people will be uplifted by that. And then no matter what the question is, you need to have your talking points that will get around to the positive, uplifting things that you want. And I'm like, I don't, people aren't stupid. They don't care about Pike's Peak if you're not answering the question. And, and I think the one thing that reporters do a very poor job, and I'll go back to Sheriff Makita and, uh, and the county commissioners. So there's a lot going on. The day that the Makita thing broke, and, and I did my show on that, and I'm a trial attorney, so I try to be careful. I want to be fair. I mean, I have been friendly with the sheriff and, and never had a, a, per, 
personal transgression with him. I had thought that he had, was a good sheriff. I had heard rumors about all of this. I, I will tell you, if you want rumors, there is not a publicly elected official, male or female, that I can't give you a rumor that they're having an affair on this. they got a problem with drugs. They've got a problem with alcohol. Their kids are completely out of control. They're an absolute obnoxious jerk to work for. If you want rumors, there are tons of them out there. And more importantly, a certain percentage of them are probably right. But I got a phone call after the show from somebody uh, who's a county commissioner. It doesn't matter who it was. But there were two points to it. And one was, you're going to hear some rumors uh, probably about me and the sheriff. But more importantly, could you please, and I did, I had already on the show let people know that you can't expect the county commissioners to talk about everything. I mean, there are legal prohibitions that have them talking about personnel matters on the one hand. And a lot of times, People will trot that out as a good excuse not to have to address them. Oh, personnel matter, we can't talk about that or whatever. If you really wanted to, without talking about that specific person or that specific case, you can give general guidelines and things that are pretty common that your department wants to do, that the public expects of your department. You can deal with that kind of thing. But the main thing was that I said, now that there's litigation, you can't expect everybody to just raise their hand and simply because you put a microphone in front of them, expect for them to start talking about that. And as a taxpayer, if that happens, I'm going to end up spending a whole heck of a lot of money on all kinds of lawsuits. And I can honestly tell you to this day, I don't know what the truth of all of that is. I, I've told people, you know, he is not what I thought he was. Uh, the situation I never thought we were going to be in, there, it's problematic to say the least. But there are other problems as well because it gets very mushy when people have political agendas and they've got their own aspirations and they either have a vendetta and want to bring this person down, maybe for legitimate reasons, maybe not, maybe they just want to get advanced here, maybe they thought they were wronged here and all of these people think they're going to make a whole bunch of money. It gets real, real complicated but trying as a public official to get out the message of what you're doing and how you're doing it, I think, if I had to say one thing, and I'll try to be brief, it would be this. If you find an issue that everybody, everybody who's in favor of child molesters in this room, everybody raise your hand in favor of that. Nobody's in favor of that. And yet law enforcement, time after time, is trying to protect their own kids, protect our kids, make sure that we don't have some pervy, you know, uh, coach at a high school taking advantage of students. We don't have somebody in the neighborhood trying to do all of that. That private stuff goes on day after day after day after day, and there's all kinds of wonderful good protection that goes on. And I think what it really takes is cultivating, this is so sad, but it takes cultivating one or two people in a, in a news department at a TV station or at a newspaper that really care about that stuff and letting them know, you know what, we put this bad guy behind jail and, and we're looking to do this and we're looking to do that and, we'll, and we really, really care because if there's one thing the public wants, whether it was when you know you were working in the DA's office or, or where you're at now or anywhere you'll be in 10 or 20 years, they want to know that you care and you're looking out for them and that they can trust you. And that if you make a mistake, you'll man up. <coughs> and um, just kidding. But, but you'll stand there in front of a microphone and say, you know what? On that day, on that case, I did the best I could under those circumstances, and I thought it was the best thing, not for me individually, but for the public, and, you know, explain what you did and why you did it, and not be in a situation where you have to have, you know, some investigative reporter trying to find some email that can indict an entire department. Does that make sense? Yeah. I sound pretty pessimistic about the media, and I wish I could tell you otherwise, but I am pretty pessimistic about the media. Um, and if there was just something I could say, because the consultant I was telling you about, her premise was everybody in this room, at some point in your career, 
is going to find yourself on the hot seat. You'll have an employee who screwed up, you'll have a coworker or a boss who screwed up, you will have screwed up. It might be a small thing that just isn't newsworthy or may be part of a huge, huge scandal. And when that happens, you have to either get somebody that you know that can help you present to the media or you've got to be able to do it yourself. And I think self-preservation is, it's, you know, just human nature, but that doesn't mean, you know, uh, cover yourself by lying and deleting emails and all of that kind of thing. Usually it just means being honest and, and letting people know what goes on. The problem, I will say, that you're going to find out sometimes is you've got lawyers, you've got bosses, you've got co-workers, you've got wives, you've got spouses, you've got best friends who tell you not to do that. And then you've got a media that sometimes, God bless them, but sometimes, I'll speak out loud, sometimes you have to be careful about doing that because they will take your truth and your best efforts and your transparency and try to spin it and use it against you or somebody else for political gain or just to get ratings. 